All right. Well, we're back with the Secret of the Golden Flower podcast uh, edition, the Chinese Book of Life, translated by Richard Wilhelm and commentary by C.G. Young. And we're back with Daniel. How you doing, bro? Doing really well. Yeah. Great. It's been, Great uh, be yeah, it's been a little bit of a break since we last talked, but um, have you been practicing at all? I have been. Um, to be honest, I uh, usually do my morning mantra meditation and then my silent meditation. And in the silent meditation, it's a bit of an edge for me to open my eyes and start with an open eye meditation. Um, because when all the stimulation of my environment comes in, even just slightly open, it can lead me to potentially get distracted. But I've been working on just opening, as the book describes, just this perfect amount to get plumb with my environment so that it's this perfect relationship between uh, fixation and contemplation, starting first, of course, with the fixation. Mm -hmm. But I will say that I could practice it more. Um, it's, it's something that I'm investigating more so at this moment, as opposed to fully jumping on board. Uh, it's hard to change up a practice, you know, totally. it takes, it takes yeah. a natural transition and I'm working on that. What about you? How's your practice been going? Good. You know, it's kind of similar. When we first started reading this, I was really diligent about doing it every day to the extent that I even started to stop chanting as much. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, there was sort of a, I don't know, in the first week or two, I felt like I made a lot of progress and uh, found myself sitting there for an hour once without even realizing that I had, done, had been sitting for an hour, which, you know, it's kind of surprising because normally I have mantras in my mind that kind of pass the time in a more chronological sense. But it did eventually plateau. And as I was telling you before we started uh, a couple of days ago, I was not able to focus at all. I was ever looking at the time and being like, that was only one minute. <laughs> and so it fluctuates. And I think that that kind of speaks to what they're saying about uh, doing this for a hundred days mm -hmm. uh, and having uh, the ability to do a meditation for 15 minutes, but having the beginning and the end completely unbroken 15 minutes. It is a sort of meditation that's so powerful that you can, if it's really unbroken between the beginning and the end, be that powerful in 15 minutes. Now, the thing that I've also noticed is I have to do some sort of energetic like breath work or mantra work in order to get my eye muscles not to fatigue by looking at the tip of my nose. If I just go straight into the nose thing, it's like I get a headache from the, my muscles straining just to do this. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have run into that as an obstacle. Mm -hmm and uh, sort of realize that after chanting or after doing some breathing and then I do it, it's my muscles have finally relaxed a little bit and I don't have the, the strain going on. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I guess without further ado, unless you have anything else you wanna add, we can um, get started. So, so the, we're on page 30. Mm -hmm. The circulation of the light and protection of the center. Master Lu Tzu said, since when has the expression circulation of the light been revealed? It was revealed by the true men of the beginning of form, Quan Yin Si. When the light is made to move in a circle, all the energies of heaven and earth of the light and dark are crystallized. That is what is termed seed-like thinking or purification of the energy or purification of the idea. When one begins to apply this magic, it is as if in the middle of being, there were non-being. When in the course of time, the work is completed and beyond the body, 
there is a body. It is as if in the middle of non-being, there were being. Only after concentrated work of a hundred days, as we just said, will the light be genuine. Then only will it become spirit fire. After a hundred days, there develops by itself in the midst of the light, a point of true light pole, young. Then suddenly there develops the seed pearl. It is as if a man and woman embraced and the concept and the conception took place. Then one must be quite still and wait. The circulation of the light is the epoch of the fire. So let's pause here and kind of digest a little bit of that. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on anything pop out at you? Hmm. Well, I would like you to describe this idea of the anima and the animus that was referenced earlier. And even though it's not specifically referenced here, how would you define yin yang based upon anima animus? And is there any correlation there? Yeah, um, we definitely have yang being the animus, and this is the heavenly light uh, of, the, of the head. And the yin is the anima, that is the waters of life. So um, let's see. The true men of the beginning of form are uh, the, the, the ones who initially discovered this circulation of the light, revealed by them. And mm -hmm. when the light is made in a circle, this is when the energies of heaven and earth uh, of the light and dark are crystallized. And this is the seed thinking. And so uh, this is sort of the beginning of the union of the anima and the animus within the heart. Mm -hmm. For me, what pops out is on page 31, where it describes this, this a similar idea, um, where the true light pull, yang, as you described, meets or develops rather. So the light pole develops or maybe illuminates, makes clear the seed pearl. And pearl is an interesting term because pearls are created at the bottom of the ocean, which is in, in the realm of water. And yang light pole is created in this heavenly abode. And so here, Although it doesn't say anima, animus, I think uh, I would agree with you that there is this unification and the fixation or the yang is that which illuminates or then suddenly develops the seed pearl. As if a man and woman embrace and a conception took place. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, and one of the things I've noticed with my experience in this meditation is uh, there are light, there are fireworks. When we do this for a while, eventually, um, especially if you do it in the dark, and that was another thing that I've noticed in this practice is it's easier to do it with either the lights dimmed, not totally dark, but dimmed. Because when you do this for long enough, I start seeing a pearl of light. Oh, wow. And what happens is this pearl percolates little scintillating, like, and it's really, what's the word? Um, uh, it's not rectilinear, the opposite of rectilinear. It's very, um, it's like a, a, a drop falling into an ocean. You see it. Okay, yeah. It's, it spreads out. And that's the goal of having this fixity is all of a sudden this pearl shows up and the pearl then pulses with the breath. Hmm. So I'm thinking that it's also, it's both symbolic and somewhat literal. I see. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the midst of the primal transformation, the radiance of the light, Yang, uh, Yang Kuang, is the determining thing. In the physical world, it is the sun. In man, the eye. The radiation and dissipation of spiritual consciousness is chiefly brought about by this energy when it is, direct, when it is directed outward, flowing downward. Therefore, the way of the golden flower depends wholly on the backward flowing method. Hmm. And this is the, in yoga terms, we use pratyahar by learning to focus our senses inwardly instead of outwardly. And we can do this with other things besides our eyes. For instance, imagine the taste of an apple. Imagine the taste of an orange. Imagine the taste of a banana. You can do it. How, how can you do that without having any external stimulus upon yourself? You can still create that experience within yourself. This is a, a gentler way of showing that we can use our mind to procure something within. It's just harder with our eyes, I think, because we're, we've really become a culture that is visual centric mm -hmm. through commercials and uh, what have you. It's, we're very susceptible to uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the way that we see things. So to, to learn how to turn that in, there's a lot of momentum that we have to go against to, mm -hmm. to reverse that tendency. Mm. Do, you, do you agree or do you have any other thoughts? I do agree. I'm just considering this metaphor around the, the eyes ruling fire and also the, there's different types of desire that's associated with um, vision. And, you know, of course, there's a watery desire, but a desire that is really, or that, that, that is based upon our visual perception um, also has to do with survival in a way, learning to see things in, in a landscape. So we've been adapted over thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, actually, to develop our vision, to become acutely aware of our of our surroundings so that we can um, obtain desirable objects and or desirable sensations therefore coming from them or potentially even to uh, procreate you know desirable uh, potential mates and it's interesting because this meditation is inviting people or inviting someone to do the exact opposite of of that concept of as, as opposed to looking in the external world for what is you desire to potentially take the same seed of desire and fixate somehow this desire so that you're collecting and I, and I liked later it uses this term collecting the thoughts or collecting desires so as opposed to going in our environment and wanting to collect things out there through this use of fire we are doing the exact opposite and starting to tidy our thoughts inward cool That's and cool. then consolidate this fire it's yeah. like a consolidation of our desire so that it may be used for other means and if you think about what fire is as this vehicle for transformation but some would say evolution as well it is the primary form of evolution of our species this, the use of this fire, whether it's to obtain um, amount of calories necessary th through cooking of food that allowed our brains to become much bigger and then therefore be able to obtain much, much higher content of caloric intake through the consumption of fats. And, and so, so that was achieved. And now it's almost as if we're doing our best to obtain some sort of energy source beyond the physical reality 
and uh, to, to these subtler states and therefore harvesting our thoughts so that our thoughts can get precise enough to become that fixation and then other sources of, uh, of inspiration and or food, spirit food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the light is our food in a way. Mm-hmm. This concept of metabolizing the light using our own fires. Right. We can't, we can't just take in the sun's light, otherwise we'll get burnt by it. But we have to use our own metabolism of our own light consciousness to metabolize the greater light. Right. Anyway, that was a big, big long. No, no. The only thing I'd want to add to that before we, before we move on to the next segment is uh, this process of circulating the light matures the, those more sophisticated or those more those bigger spiritual fruits from the unconscious by bringing because it requires a greater amount of energy or a greater amount of light to, to help bring those things to light and then thereby mature them. Uh, if we didn't have that, the ability that cultivated circulation of, of thick and, and fixity together, then we wouldn't be able to penetrate the surface and till deeper into the ground to, to harvest, as you said, mm-hmm. these bigger, more profound fruits. Mm-hmm. Right. So penetrating the surface of our unconscious, is that what you were describing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And we can't do that without consolidating the um, fires. The fire. And in- interestingly, if you think about native peoples of all different countries or countries, that's the, not the right word, all different nations, um, you know, it doesn't matter what continent you're on, at a certain time of year, they were harvesting these caloric inputs in in the same way those it's almost like those are our thoughts you know we're, we're harvesting our thoughts back to this point of fixation to the point where we are only fixating on the fixation itself and there's no more thoughts to be harvested and then that point then you can dive into the unconscious yeah interesting the circulation of the light is not only a circulation of the seed blossom of the individual body, but it is even a circulation of the true, creative, formative energies. It is not a momentary fantasy, but the exhaustion of the cycle of the eons, soul migrations. Therefore, the duration of a breath means a year, according to human reckoning, and a hundred years measured by the long night of the nine paths of reincarnation. So here we have the nine paths again. Um, We've already kind of heard my take on that. Do you, uh, do you have anything to add to that or? um... No, I think uh, I don't really. Cool, cool. Um, So this, to me, this is really interesting how the soul migrations are mentioned. So as you're describing, we're consolidating these lights uh, so that we don't have any more and so uh, uh, any, any more visible fires at this point. And so we've really c- compacted all of our ideas into one fixation and so that we can p- go back and search deeper for, for a, a new thing. This is like um, what, we, what we might call every time we go down into the unconscious, we're, we're talking about a lifetime. We're talking about souls' migrations of of evolution, churning the uh, churning the unconscious and discovering new things. What they're they're saying something pretty profound here in that doing this meditation is it's not, we're, that's not just a fantasy. This is a circulation of the true creative formative energies. They're saying in in many ways. The world out there is not as real as the world that we are doing here, even though this feels like this meditation is just, you know, it's just going on in your head, just, just your head is, they're saying is, is the true creative formative energies. Mm -hmm. And by cultivating these practices, we're actually expunging ourselves of the 
soul migrations through all nine paths. So we have the two eyes, the two no two nostrils, the mouth, the two ears, and the <laughs> genitals and, and the butt. And there's our nine uh, paths. So we're not, we're focusing on the visual here, but we're talking about all nine of these paths by turning them inwards. We are uh, speeding up our evolutionary process. Mm. And this goes further on here. After a man has one sound of individuation behind him, he will be born outward according to the circumstances. And until his old age, he will never look backward. The energy of the light exhausts itself and trickles away. That brings the ninefold darkness of reincarnations into the world. In the, bo in the book, Yen Len, uh, Lang, <laughs> Lang Yen, it is said, by concentrating the thoughts, one can fly. By concentrating the desires, one falls. When a, pu when a pupil takes little care of his thoughts and much care of his desires, he gets into the path of submersion. Only through contemplation and quietness does true intuition arise. For that, the backward flowing method is necessary. So what do, you, what do you think about this? What's your idea when they, when he mentions uh, individuation or um, yeah, I guess what, what do you, what do you have to add to that? Hmm. Where exactly does it say individuation? Uh, the um, second paragraph on page 32. Maybe you could read the line. I'm not finding it. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, after a man has the one sound of individuation behind him, he will be born outward according to the circumstances and until his old age, he will never look backward. Mm. Whew. That one is... Definitely one I'm going to need to contemplate more. I can take a guess, but it's not quite as clear as some of the other sentences in that paragraph for me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But if I were to guess, I would say it has to do with this jiva concept, this individuation, this vibration that is of source consciousness that is unique to ourself and at the same time, the essence of source consciousness and not losing fact or not losing sight of the fact that we are inseparable from source consciousness and we owe everything to source consciousness through this sound of individuation. Mm -hmm. So the sound of individuation is behind him. Mm -hmm. He will be born outward according to the circumstances until his old age, he will never look backward, look backward. It has to do with maybe this concept of faith that there isn't this subtle fear that our desires won't get met and therefore we won't need to escape through the nine paths of reincarnation and we can continue forward knowing that the sound of our individuation is a union in itself and not in, in forever will not be an individuation, but we are a sound that is, or a vibration that is of source consciousness that will eventually return to source consciousness. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do not have to grasp at these desires through the nine gates, the nine, yeah, it says the nine paths, the nine paths, or the nine gates, mm -hmm. the nine. And, and, Interestingly, gate uh, path is different because it's an open gate. So it's this openness towards this grasping. Mm -hmm. and, and the senses can be very pleasurable. Um, but it says sound here. So that, that has to do with the ears, right? 
So I'm, I'm not, it's, it's not exactly crystallized for me, but those are, that's kind of what's coming up for me. <laughs> I, I like a lot of it. I, I think that you're, I'm, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Um, what I wrote about this was, cause I thought about this for a while and cause I, I think of the sound being your name, <laughs> mm, Okay. but it's not just your name. It's your original name. So this, uh, the, the one sound of individuation, this is our mystical name. It's the natural vibratory state that we come into the world with. The author is alluding here to the practice of listening to the vibration of that inner self, not, not, uh, not let that vibration just trickle away and bring the ninefold darkness into the world. Mm -hmm. So another interesting thing that he mentions here is, uh, I didn't get until you mentioned it, that uh, it mentions this uh, until his old age and he never looks back it's the we're, we're pointing back towards the reverse flow by reversing the flow we go back to the source mm -hmm. when we we follow as as nada yoga teaches us we follow the sound of our name back to the bindu and mm -hmm. that's as you said an audit, auditory way of doing the fixity mm -hmm. instead of using our eyes we're using our ears to follow that so it's the same method. It's just mentioning it through the auditory uh, pathway here. Mm -hmm. And there's a faith that's here as well, because it's the never looking backward is also in, in this concept of time, which of course is multidimensional, but in our lives, there is a sequence to time. And therefore there is a sequence to how we perceive time in this current state. And because of that, there is this forward momentum that also takes a great faith. Um, and, and the reason that I mention that is because there is a lot of people in today's world, and, you know, myself included at moments, that might take more of a diagonal or maybe even sometimes a backward <laughs> uh, path in terms of this, of this remembrance you know, call me by my true name and this, this soul essence name, which also has to do with Jiva, this, this essence that is just uniquely yours, but in, in Jiva is also another name for Jupiter, which rules this good space element, which sound rules, right? So there's also that correlation there too. Mm. To remember your true name in this forward momentum mm. takes a great oh, that's beautiful internally. And we have to have this faith moving forward um, through our old age it, or in, until his old age, we will never look backward. So it, it, it's a whole life of this, of this contemplation of, of our true name and using these tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, how about the, uh, Concentrating on thoughts, you can fly. Concentrating on desires, you fall. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because thoughts here is, it, it's, it's almost as if, you know, con uh, concentration or fixation, we, we don't want to be concerned with thoughts. But you need to focus on them at first in order to then harvest them. And to make them have this fixity to your thinking. And so, but, but desires, desires is a portal to the nine, uh, the nine reincarnations or the nine uh, thresholds, the nine gates that lead you out. So there's this outward momentum with desires and with harvesting thoughts or fixating on thoughts, there's more of this inward orientation. So I think that's the primary difference. What do you think? Uh, I, I think that's, I'm a lot of insight there. Thank you. That was new, new information for me. I had a simpler thought that thoughts are just materially lighter and desires are more watery. They're more, they're heavier. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on the light keeps us from falling into the lethargy and, uh, from, or from falling into reverie as, as you've mentioned. Um, oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah, so thoughts have more buoyancy to them 
and then therefore is an e easier place to start as opposed to immediately jumping into the deep dark desires which need the light to illuminate them to make them clear to to free up the energy that they have mm -hmm. right to help the process of differentiation and kind of assimilation and integrating <laughs> so in the book of secret correspondences it is said release is in the eye in the simple questions of the yellow ruler it is said the seed blossoms of the human body must be concentrated upward in the empty space this refers to it immortality is contained in this sentence and also the overcoming of the world is contained in it this is the common goal of all religions that sounds pretty important <laughs> Any thoughts on that one? Oh, man. Whew. Well, I like this yellow, this, this yellow ruler. Mm. Um, I'm going to go back to the metaphor of Jiva being associated with Jupiter and the release the release is in the eye. Mm -hmm. So there's this giving way to the fire element, this releasing of the fire element once the, the thoughts have been gathered. So the fire has done its job. Similarly, and, and I'll bring it to, to a metaphor that's very uh, concrete. I was recently at a controlled burn um, in Maidu territory near where I live here in the Sierra Nevada mountain foothills, um, there was a controlled burn orchestrated by some Maidu elders and also some ecologists. And there was this, this peacefulness that was happening amidst this fire, all these small fires that were being burnt. And the time of year now is, uh, is spring, you know, we've been having some rain, some late rains here. It's been wonderful weather for, for controlled burns. And there were maybe 50 to 100 fires happening throughout a landscape. And these fires were all happening in different places. And normally when fire is on a landscape such as this, in a, in a very spread out way, it creates negative space. And what I mean by negative space is there isn't calmness in the atmosphere. There's a sense of anxiety, fear, panic. And in this situation, it was the complete opposite. And it was the first time I've ever witnessed the gathering or the many, many fires. And it, and it felt as if it was as if our consciousness, if we're looking at it on a metaphor in our own land, inner landscape, there was many thoughts that were happening all at once. You know, we all have different fires in our life, different things happening. And at one point, there was this fixity in that every fire had its place and was being controlled and, 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 and nothing was out of balance. Everything had its place. And eventually the fires dimmed down and there was a great peace amongst us. And to me, this was a good space. It was as if the fires were able to be gathered and harvested and, and not controlled because that's not the right way. Even though it's control, called a controlled burn, it was as if the fires were allowed to do the work they were needed, needing to do in their own time and concentrated to, to do the work they needed to do. And then it created this nice, good space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how, this, how does this relate to this phrase? Well, <laughs> maybe abstractly it relates in the sense that there was a release in the eye. So for me, what this means is that there is a release in this focusing, this, this needing to control, this needing for the fire or the thoughts to be any particular way, but they all had their place. And there was this peace that could come from thoughts having their place, but there was also this concentration, this, this harvesting energy there. And then after that happens, then the yellow ruler emerges. 
in the simple question of the yellow ruler, it is said the seed blossoms of the human body must be concentrated upward in the empty space. So all of the debris has been burned away. <laughs> all of this, uh, you know, all of the tree limbs and pine cones and pine needles had all been burned away. And what was left was this beautiful empty space. And therefore, this also reminds me of the relationship between Mars and Jupiter, Mars being the guardian of, of the castle of, of the emperor ruler, who is Jupiter, who is also known as the yellow one. Um, and so the, 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 the true teacher can have the good space it needs to have the, the potency and the magnetic qualities that it, it, it needs to have in order to guide and inform our lives. Sure. I'll end it there. <laughs> no, that's cool. Cause uh, that's really the purpose of a controlled fire after all is creating space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to create good space. Yeah, good well, space in the forest, you know? Right, right. So that when the fire comes, it comes to a place where it can't keep burning because it's already been burned. Mm -hmm. uh, a safe space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very cool. That, and, and then all of that can be deduced also uh, to the comment about all religions. We see that all of these fires, they're all serving a valid purpose. And that's the, the goal of each fire is the same goal. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for hanging in there with me. <laughs> no, I, I really yeah. appreciated that, that input. Um, so the next paragraph, the light is not in the body alone, nor is it only outside the body. Mountains and rivers and the great earth are lit by the sun and moon. All that is this light. Therefore, it is not only within the body. Understanding and clarity, perception and enlightenment and all the movements of the spirit are likewise this light. Therefore, it is not just something outside the body. The light flower of heaven and earth fills all the thousand spaces but also the light flower of the individual body passes through heaven and covers the earth. Therefore, as soon as the light is circulating, heaven and earth, mountains and rivers are all circulating with it at the same time. To concentrate the seed flower of the human body above in the eyes, that is the great key of the human body. Children, take heed. Even Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita. He doesn't say children, take heed, but he says, fix your, fix your awareness on the nose. If for a day you do not practice meditation, this light streams out. Who knows whither? Who knows where? If you only meditate for a quarter of an hour, by it you can do away with 10,000 eons and 1,000 births. All methods end in quietness. This marvelous magic cannot be fathomed. Wow, it's so beautiful. I, I think that's a wonderful paragraph. Do you have anything to add to it? I don't. I, I think that speaks for itself. No. no, it speaks for itself. And wow, it's just such a good affirmation. Very, very so poetic, too. It's just but when the practice is started, one must press on from the obvious to the profound, from the coarse to the fine. Everything depends on there being no interruption. The beginning and the end of the practice must be one. In between, there are cooler and warm moments, like my meditation two days ago. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty cool and not a cool way. <laughs> that goes without saying. But the goal must be to reach the vastness of heaven and the depths of the sea, so that all methods seem quite easy and taken for granted. Only then we have mastered it. Mm -hmm. All holy men have bequeathed this to one another. Nothing is possible without contemplation. Fan Cho, reflection. When Confucius says, perceiving brings one to the goal, 
or when Buddha calls it the vision of the heart, or Lao Tzu says inner vision, it is all the same. Anyone can talk about reflection, but he cannot master it if he does not know what the word means. What has to be reversed by reflection is this, the self-conscious heart, which has to be directed it in itself towards that point where the formative spirit is not yet manifest. Within our six foot body, we must strive for the form which existed before the laying down of heaven and earth. If today people sit and meditate only one or two hours looking only at their own egos and call this reflection, how can anything come of it? So I think here we can definitely um, flesh out what is this reflection? What does it really mean to be in reflection? Hmm. Yeah, I think before we started talking, I asked you a very similar question. <laughs> and I really liked your answer. Oh. And um, wondering if you feel comfortable sharing sure yeah feel. sure um well i mean it's kind of hard to to regurgitate it um so what was your question again my, my question was how do, how do we know if if it's true reflection contemplation or if we are just as it describes here, looking at our own egos. How do we know if we're truly uh, looking at the self-conscious heart, which has to direct itself towards the point where the formative spirit is not yet manifest? How do we know we're directing this reflective contemplative energy on parts of our subconscious that need illumination? Mm -hmm. Or whether or not we're just creating these stories about our own ego and just continuing to loop. Right. And, and, and then therefore you brought it back to this, this need for fixation first and right. how the fixation is the guide to whether you are in fact doing true contemplation or in fact, you're the, the, the fixation is just creating more stories itself by not harvesting the thought to a specific point. And right. then just, yeah. So maybe that reminds you. Yes. Yes. So the thought that I had was, through doing the practice and then this practice isn't necessarily easy especially in the beginning i think that in some ways it's totally possible to have this be your first meditative practice but this was not my first meditative practice and so one thing that helped me a lot was doing some form of practice before i started this practice as I said before, like it, my eyes got fatigued and, and, you know, not doing any breathing or, or trying to not necessarily trying to breathe very gently is how, how they describe the recommendation here. And that is also, it, it wasn't as vigorous of a meditative process as I was used to. So the thing that I noticed about through, uh, about this process was when I was fixating my mind and all of a sudden I saw the pearl and the pearl started to create this pond splash of light around me and I kept my mind and my my focus on the tip on that center point despite the amazing excitement of colors and whatnot that was happening around me, I felt myself climbing deeper and deeper into myself and deeper into the meditation. And I got to a point where I could just feel through, through the breathing process, light flooding in through my eyes. And it was flooding in according to this rhythmic, gentle flow of the breath. To the point where you can't even hear your breath, but you, you, can, you can only feel it. And it's almost like you're not even breathing. Your heart is breathing your, your chest for you. And all of a sudden, everything in your body is happening of its own accord. 
and yet your mind is still there. That to me was an indication that I was definitely not just going in circles. And so I think the joke that I finished it with was when you know, you know, because something's happening that's very not normal. Mm -hmm. And that's an indication, like in the same way that you have to go to the bathroom, you don't, you're not sure if it's like, if you have to go to the bathroom, you don't have to ask yourself, do I really have to go to the bathroom? You know, because you feel it. And that, I guess, was the easy way for me to, to try and answer your question. For sure. Um, I don't think there's an intellectual answer because there's so many ways we can get lost in, in ego stories. So I think, as you summed up, I, I agree. I think the first thing to do is fix the vision. And once you fix the vision, make the breath even and try and make it as quiet as possible. And then once that happens, the next goal is to not be distracted by the lights, as beautiful and as interesting as they may be. And from there, it just gets more and more profound. <laughs> um, I think that explains it pretty well. And then, then the, this next paragraph, it describes this process of reorienting to the tip of the nose as the cue for when, um, for instance, since if you start to get into your own story or the ego, that which creates the story, I think is what is being termed here as ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. When we're, we're, we're getting too interested in this story, this next paragraph helps us figure out what we need to do next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Founders of Buddhism and Taoism have taught that one should look at the tip of one's nose but they did not mean that one should fasten one's thoughts to the tip of the nose. <laughs> Neither they mean that while the eyes were looking at the tip of the nose, the thoughts should be concentrated on the yellow middle. Wherever the eyes look, the heart is directed also. How can it be directed at the same time upward, yellow middle, and downward, tip of the nose? Or alternatively, so that it is now up, now down? All that means confusing the finger with which one points to the moon with the moon itself. Yeah, this gets pretty um, difficult to explain in a yeah intellectual point of view. Yeah, there was something that kind of came to me recently about the difference between a contradiction and a paradox. Okay. And this is a perfect example of that it on the sur it on the on the surface it looks like you're telling me to focus here but then you're at the same time saying focus here which one is it and the the real pointing here is uh just focus and it, there's a going with of pa the paradox is it's um it's moving, but it's not moving. It's moving, it's moving on a plane um, that is circular. So it's a, it's a closed loop. It's not going from here to here. It's, it's, uh, it's still one thing, but it's a continuous thing. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's all of its parts. It's not two snapshots, not mm -hmm. just two snapshots. Mm -hmm. I often hear um, from folks, in, in my practice who are just starting to meditate or curious about meditation around these instructions that have multiple parts to them. For instance, uh, breathing and counting or um, doing a mantra and also focusing on the breath or listening to, uh, let's say, recording and also focusing on the breath. And I'm wondering... And I think you described it really well. There's this, there's this circular nature around focusing, how there's many parts to a potential focusing exercise. But if you were to, correct me if I'm wrong, but the first step is the, the focusing on the tip of the nose. And it is almost as, it, as it's the pointer finger in terms of the moon metaphor pointing at the moon. And the the yellow um, the yellow uh, the yellow ruler 
is the good space in the head that is the fixation between the point of the eyes is what you're pointing to. And then it doesn't end there though, of course, there's also this contemplation that happens in the heart. And so there's these multiple parts that, you know, as, as you mentioned, this isn't necessarily the best meditation for a beginner to practice, but at the same time, it does happen on its own accord when you take it step by step by step and it, and it lays out what the first step is later and then maybe in, even in the next paragraph here um, where the eyes, the eyelids are shut partially and the, the focus is on the tip of the nose. And so that's a great starting point, but knowing that it's not the, it's not the ending point either. It's mm -hmm. just the beginning of the pointing finger to the moon. But you have to start at the finger, right? Otherwise, you can't get oriented to the moon. Right. So there's a sequence here and a wholeness here. And depending on where one's at, the sequence can be helpful and taking it step by step. And also the wholeness must also be held and it shouldn't be discarded. And yeah, one can hold both of those concepts. Right, right. Very good. So, uh, is it, uh, what then, mm -hmm. what then is really meant by this? The extra, the expression tip of the nose is very cleverly chosen. The nose must serve the eyes as a guideline. If one is not guided by the nose, either one opens the eyes wide and the eyes look into the distance so that the nose is not seen or the lids shut too much so that the eyes close again and the nose is not seen. But when the eyes are opened too wide, one makes the mistake of directing them outwardly, whereby one is easily distracted. If then they are closed too much, one makes the mistake of letting them turn inward, whereby easily slinks into dreamy reverie. Only when the eyelids are lowered properly halfway is the tip of the nose seen in just the right way. Therefore, it is taken as a guideline. The main thing is to lower the eyelids in the right way and then to allow the light to stream in of itself without effort, wanting the light to stream in concentratedly. Looking at the tip of the nose serves only as the beginning of the inner concentrations so that the eyes are brought into the right direction for looking and then are held to the guideline. After that, one can let it be. That is the way a mason hangs up a plumb line. As soon as he has hung it up, he guides his work by it without continually bothering himself to look at the plumb line. Fix, a fixating contemplation is a Buddhist method which has not by any means been handed down as a secret. One looks with both eyes at the tip of the nose, sits upright, and in a comfortable position, holds the heart to the center in the midst of conditions. In Taoist, in Taoism, it is called the yellow middle. In Buddhism, the center of the midst of conditions. The two are the same. It does not necessarily mean the middle of the head. It is only a matter of fixing one's thinking on the point which lies exactly between the two eyes. Then all is well. The light is something extremely mobile. When one fixes the thought on the midpoint between the two eyes, the light streams in of its own accord. It is not necessary to direct the attention, especially to the central castle. In these few words, the most important thing is contained. So this is very just instructional, almost like anatomically instructional. And I think mm -hmm. that this is a great uh, description. These paragraphs are a perfect place for, for beginning meditators just to come back and remind themselves that because it's very experientially based. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Or no, no I it? think it, it, it says it all there. Yeah. The center in the middle, in the midst of conditions. By the way, I love the term midst of conditions. Uh, the center in the midst of conditions is a very subtle expression. The center is omnipresent. Everything is contained in it. It is connected with the release of the whole process of the creation. 
The condition is the portal. The condition that is the fulfillment of that condition makes the beginning, but it does not bring about the rest with an inevitable necessity. The meaning of these two words is very fluid and subtle. Fixating contemplation is indispensable. It ensures the making of fast enlightenment. Only one must not stay sitting rigidly or worldly thoughts will come up, but one must examine where the thought is, where it began and where it fades out. Nothing, nothing is gained by pushing reflection further. One must be con content to see where the thought arose and not seek beyond the point of origin. For to find the heart, consciousness, to get behind consciousness with consciousness, that cannot be done. In the same way that you can't bite your teeth with your teeth, or you can't bite your, you can't touch the tip of your, this finger with the tip of this finger. <laughs> Together, we want to bring the states of the heart to rest. That is true contemplation. What contradicts it is false contemplation. That leads to no goal. When the flight of the thoughts keep extending further, one should stop and begin contemplating. <laughs> Let one contemplate and then start fixating again. That is the double method of making fast the enlightenment. It means the circulation of the light. The circulation is fixation. The light is contemplation. Fixation without contemplation is circulation without light. Contemplation without fixation is light without circulation. Take note of that. And that brings us to the end of that chapter. I really love that last part. Um, but let, if you do have anything you wanna add um, from anything that caught your uh, ear from before that. Yeah, I, I really like the last few paragraphs here. They're just great reminders and great fundamentals <laughs> uh, in, in the realm of meditation. It's indispensable, the instruction here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I there's love it. not really much that I would like to add. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. The content itself, what about you? I thought it was just amazing that we were you were mentioning the portal before I even got up to that point I was like oh my god they did write that in there mm -hmm. and um yeah it's it's just uh just wonderful imagery that's so instructional and um bore out through experience yeah and it says the meaning of these two words is very fluid and subtle and I would like to add this whole process is very fluid and very subtle. And whenever these very subtle, fluid concepts are described, it, it, can, it can feel very intellectual or a term that I hear a lot is heady, um, meaning that trying to, to compartmentalize these very subtle, nuanced, subjective experiences into words but i would also like to give credit to these words that they are incredibly informative and helpful in describing these very subtle nuanced subjective experiences within during this process um and you know just to reiterate how i'm understanding this Potentially that's, that could be helpful. So this, this fixation is what creates this dynamic movement. Is, is that how I'm understanding it? And the contemplation itself is the light. So the way that I see it um, is like the, the, the contemplation without fixation is light without circulation. To me, like I rephrase that by saying the fixation loses its ability to be circumspect in viewing the midst of conditions. So 
uh, the way that I see it is we have a contemplation, which implies the, what do we call it? Uh, the, um, the midst of conditions. So our contemplation is this midst of conditions. And the fixation is the thing that is constantly churning that midst of conditions. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like, it's that yang pole that is uh, agitating like, stir, like a stirring rod mm -hmm. that's, that's mixing. And, and through the churning of that, we have from the perspective of you know, the Hindu pantheon world, we churn butter. So when we walk out into the world, you, the milk gets diluted into water, but butter will always float on the surface of, of, of water. So this, these meditations, this, this pole is, is the churning rod, which our fixation is doing. And the midst of um, conditions is the milk. Mm -hmm. And by doing this practice, our midst of conditions, when we go out in the world, it gets next it gets mixed up with the world with other people's situations and and thereby our milk gets mixed with everybody else's and it becomes cultured you know we become cultured in different ways and the goal of this practice is to become butter though so we want that fixation to to constantly be churning the the light mm -hmm. and and creating that, that sense of uh, circumspect uh, awareness around all the different um, elements that we encounter as we, as we probe the midst of conditions. Got it. That's how I was understanding it too. Though I am feeling the need to blend this previous concept we had around the, the the pole or this yang pole being this light pole that was fixation itself. And now th they're saying that fixation is circulation. So I'm wondering how the fixation or, or, or rather the, um, the mm -hmm. light pole is light which becomes fixation, which also is this process of circulation. And yet there is light that needs to be circulated itself. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. So how it transforms from this light yang pole to a circulating quality through fixation. Mm -hmm. So the, the thought that I get is, whether we do this meditation or not, there, our fixation is a natural function of our mind. We're, we fixate on everything that we do in life. That's how we're, we have a, a, a capacity. We have an attainment of differentiation. I, I know that this is a table and I know that this is a cup and there's a, a degree of fixation that has to, that allows for me to know something. When we do, when we abstract our, our fixation into something inwardly, it starts to think, it starts to not really have anything to grab onto. But with practice, this, it becomes a, instead of a, when we think of a young pole, we think of it as a noun, right? It's like a thing, right? But it's not, it's a verb. It's a, it's a, it's a, in the same way that our eyes are constantly renewing information as we as we're projecting our, 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 our looking out into the world, when we do that inwardly, we, we create a fixation of, of awareness into the into a, a, a point that is this pole. And right. so it's not really a thing. It's more of a it's a process of training our awareness to 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 do this, and thereby uh, the midst of uh, the cloud of, of our uh, conditions, so to speak, sort of reveals itself to us, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, but- uh, it, it does. I, I just wanna like tease apart this concept of light 
Mm -hmm. Because light, it's almost as if we have to start with the light of fixation through harvesting our thoughts and focusing on, the, on our thoughts as opposed to our desires. We can't just go, like you said previously, try to immediately illuminate our desires with this light. Otherwise, we'll just be acting on them all the time. Um, so we have to start with the thoughts and really focus on bringing light in this fix, fixated quality on the tip of the nose and then eventually between the eyes. And then once it's concentrated there, this light can then begin to circulate. And then as it's circulating, it's illuminating the light within, mm -hmm. which is contemplation. And then the contemplation becomes, it's almost as like you're charging this yes. inner center with the light. Right. And then it, it lights up in a way. Yes. And then next thing you know, the, the, the fixation is no longer in charge of bringing the light. It's now concentrated on circulating the light. Mm. Once the light has found its abode, in, as opposed to in the realm of thoughts, the thoughts have been harvested, fixated, and now the contemplated or the, the contemplation be, can begin to differentiate the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I think you're right on with that. Uh, it, it's almost like what you're describing is a Taurus, and you don't notice that it's a Taurus until you notice that it it uh, there's a there's a North Pole and there's a South Pole. And so through mm -hmm. the fixation, uh, the fixation eventually gets a, a, a degree of concentration of the light to the point where it reveals um, the midst of conditions to an extent that it's dim. It's a dimly conceived midst of conditions, but you can notice that it's, that it, you have a, a circumspect uh, conception of it as opposed to before when you'd had no conception of it you were just trying to cultivate fixation mm -hmm. so you're right. right i think the first thing is to just get the breath and get the fixation to a point where there's a there's a cultivated habit of stillness and then from that as it says, the, the light streams in of its own accord, and then uh, the mist of conditions reveals itself as if it's almost yearning to be discovered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, like it. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah. If you don't have anything else to add, I I I think um, we could probably wind up uh wrapping up here i'm not sure how long we've gone here i think it's been a little while but uh yeah, sounds good my battery's yeah. almost dead too but um cool well daniel as always thanks for coming on we have i think one more chapter of this until yeah we got circulation of the light and making the breath rhythmical uh next time up and uh, oh there's part five too so we have um and part six so there's a few more up coming up. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. And Daniel, is there anything that uh, um, if anybody wants to uh, find out what your services are and whatnot, uh, what they can go to to get that? Well, the website's still being built. Okay. But very soon, hopefully by the time we're done with the sixth one, I can tell folks about that. Cool. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, we continued then. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.